Let us hear God's word in the book of Exodus, chapter 35. Exodus, chapter 35. And Moses gathered all the congregation of the children of Israel together and said unto them, These are the words which the Lord hath commanded that ye should do them. Six days shall work be done, but on the seventh day there shall be to you an holy day a Sabbath of rest to the Lord. Whosoever doeth work therein shall be put to death. You shall kindle no fire throughout your habitations upon the Sabbath day. And Moses spake unto all the congregation of the children of Israel, saying, This is the thing which the Lord commanded, saying, Take ye from among you an offering unto the Lord. Whosoever is of a willing heart, let him bring it, an offering of the Lord, gold and silver and brass, and blue and purple and scarlet, and fine linen and goat's hair, and ram skins dyed red and badger skins, and shittim wood, and oil for the light, and spices for anointing oil, and for the sweet incense." and onyx stones, and stones to be set for the ephod and for the breastplate. And every wise-hearted among you shall come and make all that the Lord hath commanded, the tabernacle, his tent, and his covering, his tashes, and his boards, his bars, his pillars, and his sockets, the ark, and the staves thereof with the mercy seat, and the veil of the covering, the table, and his staves, and all his vessels, and the showbread, the candlestick also for the light, and his furniture, and his lamps, with the oil for the light, and the incense altar, and his staves, and the anointing oil, and the sweet incense, and the hanging for the door at the entering in of the tabernacle, the altar of burnt offering with his brazen grate, his staves and all his vessels, the laver and his foot, the hangings of the court, his pillars and their sockets, and the hanging for the door of the court, the pins of the tabernacle and the pins of the court and their cords, the cloths of service to do service in the holy place, the holy garments for Aaron the priest, and the garments of his sons to minister in the priest's office. And all the congregation of the children of Israel departed from the presence of Moses. And they came, every one whose heart stirred him up, and every one whom his spirit made willing. And they brought the Lord's offering to the work of the tabernacle of the congregation, and for all his service, and for the holy garments. And they came, both men and women, as many as were willing-hearted, and brought bracelets, and earrings, and rings, and tablets, all jewels of gold. And every man that offered, offered an offering of gold unto the Lord. And every man with whom was found blue, and purple, and scarlet, and fine linen, and goat's hair and red skins of rams and badger skins brought them. Every one that did offer an offering of silver and brass brought the Lord's offering. And every man with whom was found shit and wood for any work of the service brought it. And all the women that were wise-hearted did spin with their hands and brought that which they had spun, both of blue and of purple, and of scarlet, and of fine linen. And all the women whose hearts stirred them up in wisdom spun goat's hair. The rulers brought onyx stones, and stones to be set for the ephod and for the breastplate, and spice, and oil for the light, and for the anointing oil, and for the sweet incense. The children of Israel brought a willing offering unto the Lord, every man and woman, whose heart made them willing to bring for all manner of work which the Lord had commanded to be made 
by the hand of Moses. And Moses said unto the children of Israel, See, the Lord hath called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. And he hath filled him with the Spirit of God, in wisdom, in understanding, and in knowledge, and in all manner of workmanship, and to devise curious works, to work in gold, and in silver, and in brass, and in the cutting of stones, to set them, and in carving of wood, to make any manner of cunning work. And he hath put in his heart that he may teach both he and Aholiab, the son of Ahissamach, of the tribe of Dan. Them hath he filled with wisdom of heart to work all manner of work of the engraver and of the cunning workman and of the embroiderer in blue and in purple, in scarlet and in fine linen, and of the weaver, even of them that do any work, and of those that devise cunning work. Amen. May God bless that reading of his own holy word. Let us read again in Exodus chapter 20, sorry, Exodus 35. Exodus chapter 35. And we'll read verses 30 and 31. Exodus 35 at verse 30. And Moses said unto the children of Israel, See, the Lord hath called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. And he hath filled him with the Spirit of God in wisdom in understanding, and in knowledge, and in all manner of workmanship. The church has a tendency to divide asunder what God has joined together. And not only to divide what God has joined, but then to devalue what we have divided, at least one part of our division. A prime example of that is the way the church has often viewed human nature. We, as a church, often divide human nature into body and soul. And then we devalue, usually, the body and exalt the value of the soul way above the body. And yet God has joined these two together and given great value to both. Another example of the way the church divides and devalues is in the area of work. The church has historically, and even up to this day, tended to divide work, sometimes using economic standards, sometimes using moral standards. And so, for example, often head work is divided from handwork, or knowledge work is divided from manual work. Physical work is divided from intellectual work. And often the church has given great value to, to knowledge work, to head work, and greatly devalued physical work or, or manual work, as we often call it. Sometimes we We do that dividing and devaluing on money grounds. We perhaps look at knowledge work like medicine, law, accountancy, computer programming, and we see that these kinds of jobs get get much higher pay. 
perhaps than in general many manual trades. And so we think, well, these are much more worthy than these. But sometimes we actually make the division and the devaluation on moral grounds as well. We sometimes have this kind of scale. If we don't speak it, we we often think it, that we've got minister's work up there, a kind of sacred head work. And then quite a bit further down, maybe we've got secular head work, like law, programming, whatever. And then much further down, we've got hand work or manual work. And we somehow see one as far more worthy than the other. What I want to show you this evening is that such dividing and devaluing is unbiblical. It's wrong. I want to show you that God as our creator has called us, his creatures, to image his creativity in whatever calling he has given us, whether it's head work or hand work, if we want to put it that way. He's, he's created us to create. He's called us to creativity. And he's called us to bear his image as the creative creator in whatever part of the creation he's called us to serve him in. You might be very surprised here when God in Exodus 35 is setting apart a manual laborer to do metal work and stone work and woodwork. You might be very surprised to read these words. He hath filled him with the Spirit of God in wisdom and understanding and in knowledge and in all manner of workmanship. Because we often do not associate spirituality with this kind of handwork or manual work. I want to do this because I want everyone to see the value and dignity of their work. And I believe in doing so, this will also lead us to deeper knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to look first of all at the source of manual work or the source of handwork. Where did this begin? Well, God was the first manual laborer. God made things. And he didn't just, as it were, speak. He took the dust of the earth and he shaped it and formed it into man. Then he took a male rib and out of that made woman. God made things. He got his hands dirty, you might say. He he got into the material he created and put it together in a beautiful and creative way. God is the source of all handwork, of all manual work. And he didn't just, he's not just the first manual laborer. The first job he created was a manual job. He created the work of gardening and he called his first creatures into that work, Adam and Eve. This was the work with which they would honor and glorify their creator. And then when we come to Exodus 35, we see how here God calls Bezalel and Aholiab into the manual building work. This this building project of constructing the tabernacle. And indeed, as we've noticed here... Uh, We're told that God filled 
Bezalel in particular with the Holy Spirit. And you know that's the first time in the Bible that we're told the Holy Spirit filled a person. And yet, the work that he was filled to do was woodwork and metal work and stone work. Bezalel was called to this work no less than Moses was called to his work. And then, of course, we think of Jesus. He was a manual worker for much longer than he was a preacher. He spent more years of his life as a carpenter than as a discipler. When we begin to look at this kind of work with this biblical lens, do we not begin to see how whatever the world and the church makes of manual labor, God puts a dignity on it and elevates the beauty of it. God invented handwork. He created handwork. He commanded handwork. In Bezalel and Aholiab, he called into it and equipped for it. And therefore, when we consider the source of all these gifts, does this not make us glorify God? We should be tracing all gifts, all work gifts, all hand gifts, all manual labor gifts to God. And of course, by saying that, we're not excluding knowledge workers and head workers, those who operate less with hands, much more with head. I'm emphasizing this because it's this kind of work that is often put down. I'm just trying to raise it up to the level the Bible gives it as well. So let's trace all these gifts back to our Creator. Any skill, any ability to make and to do is only the result of the image of God in man. And so we trace these gifts to our Creator and we seek, with God's help, to image our Creator in our daily work. And really, in many ways, that's what Bezalel is doing here. He's a, he's a type, he's a picture, he's a, 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 a human demonstration of the Creator. He glorifies his Creator here by showing forth the creativity the skillful ingenuity of God, the source of handwork. Secondly, though, consider here the range of handwork. What a variety of gifts we find on this building site. Woodworking, metalworking, stoneworking, jewel setting, cloth cutting, needlework, and of course, it is when we're talking about handwork, it, this, we're not saying this was mindless, as if the head was not involved. Of course not. Bezalel needed a lot of skills up here as well. Planning, organizing, managing, problem solving. He had to get these co-workers together. He had to lead this great team And when we, when we try and picture this scene, try and do it in your mind in the middle of this wilderness. Try and, try and go through this chapter again and look at all that was brought and all that had to be put together. All that had to be chiseled and hammered and sawed and carved and molded and cut and sewn and glued. And it's just this, it's an amazing sight to behold in the middle of the wilderness. And, and as we look down on this site, as it were, with this bird's eye view, we see this vast range of skills, this vast range of, of creativity. And in this we see God. There is no creative skill, there is no talent on this earth that has not come from God. 
As we, as we look down on Israel doing all these tasks, we're just seeing a little insight into the mind of God and the skill of God and the talent of God. In, in this vast range of, of skills, we see the vast character of our creator. John Calvin said this, All the arts come from God and are to be respected as divine inventions. Matthew Henry said, skill in common arts and employments is the gift of God. From him are derived both the faculty and the improvement of the faculty. So here we see in this, in this great range of handwork, we see God's creativity. And, and these are the kinds of eyes that we should take with us out into the world. Not just as we look at Exodus 35 and see this great range of skills, but let's look on the world in this way. When, when you see a, a gardener pruning his trees, when you see a, when you see a, a plumber putting together his pipes, When you see an electrician working with these junction boxes, when you see that that painter painting these walls, when you see that mother making that home, when you see that carpet fitter laying these rugs, when, when you see tables and pews and lights, and what are we seeing? Well, most of us, we don't think of anything, do we? But we should be thinking. We should be we should be seeing God's amazing creativity in all these activities, in all these productions, in in the process and in the end result. Let let all these things, wherever we are, whether we're in the orchard, whether we're in the factory, whether we're in the workshop, whether we're in the kitchen, wherever we are, let's be looking. For signs and symbols of God's creativity. And see the the range of character in him. Somebody says this. All these gifts have something in common. Bringing order, purpose and form to our world for the benefit of humanity. And work in its variety of forms glorifies God because it mirrors our working God to the world. Try and think of that tomorrow when you go to work. When you lift the hammer. When you lift the saw. When you, you're cleaning the dishes or whatever. It's mirroring our working God to the world. In fact, you know Luther, he went this far. He said this, God even milks the cows. Through those called to that work. The range of handwork. But thirdly, consider the necessity of handwork or of manual work. We're told in Acts 7 that Moses was trained in all the wisdom of Egypt. But he couldn't do this work. You might, you might call Moses a knowledge worker, but he wasn't a very practical worker. He could learn, and he could teach, and he could write, but not work with his hands. That wasn't his background. That's not what these kinds of people did when they were brought up in Pharaoh's household. And so, here... God had a purpose. God had a plan. It was to build a house that would display and demonstrate and advertise God's story of salvation. That's what the tabernacle was. It was a a picture story of salvation. And he looked at Moses and he thought, Moses can't do that. So he looks around and he finds someone who can. Which was Bezalel, Naholiab. They were needed 
to advance God's cause, to advance God's kingdom, to display God's name and to advance the plan of redemption. This this wasn't just some kind of secondary matter. Building the tabernacle was as important as carrying the law down to Mount Sinai. In fact, you might say in some ways it was even more important. Because the law couldn't save. But the tabernacle, that was the primary way of God saving sinners at this time. This was the place that God revealed his grace through the furniture, the design, as we'll see, but also through, of course, the sacrifices that were being made, pointing towards the ultimate sacrifice. So these skills were absolutely necessary for the plan of redemption. They were needed. They were vital. And and that's the way we should consider all manual gifts, all hand work, and head work, of course. God has not bestowed any unnecessary gifts on anyone. Every gift God gives is a necessary gift. He doesn't let a hair of our head fall to the ground without his knowledge. And he certainly doesn't bestow a gift on anyone without his knowledge, his intent, his wise purpose being involved. There are no accidental gifts. Not in your life, not in anyone's life. And, and so if he's gifted you with Bezalel type gifts... Don't try and be a Moses and don't envy the Moseses either. And if God's blessed you with Moses type gifts, don't despise the Bezaleels and the Aholiabs. Both are vital and both are necessary in God's plan of salvation. He uses head workers and hand workers, knowledge workers and, and, and manual workers. Don't, whatever you do, ever look at your your vocation, your calling in life and just see it as, as pointless and meaningless. Here, God has bestowed these gifts in connection with his plan of redemption. And listen to this. Every single gift God has given is connected with his plan of redemption. Not just the ones here in Exodus 35. Because these gifts that God bestows for our daily callings and work are part of the all things that work together for good to those who love God. Aren't they? Or are they outside of that? Are they not part of the all things? They are. They're all, they are part of the all things. That God is working together for good. The church and the world need both these ranges of gifts. The church needs them and the world needs them. As this quote says, they they all have something in common, bringing order, purpose and form to our world for the benefit of humanity. We can go further. For the benefit of those who love God. And we can't see these connections. You drive past the building site tomorrow. You see all these people working. You can't trace that to somebody being saved. God's sovereignty being advanced. You, you, you look at yourself maybe tomorrow. You're, you're trying to clean up your children's mess. You're, you're working with dirty clothes and dirty dishes. You, you can't see A connection between this handwork and God's work. That's where faith comes in. What do you think Bezalel thought when he was in Egypt? Laboring away on these pyramids. Laboring away on palaces for Pharaoh. He probably thought at the time, this is utterly pointless. It's meaningless. I'm just slaving away here, wasting my life, sweating and toiling and going home shattered, getting up the next day, and it's all for nothing. 
And yet here we are, just a few years down the line, and he's building a house, not for the glory of Pharaoh, but for the glory of God. We have to believe, even in the most unpromising circumstances and situations, that not just our Sunday worship, but our Monday to Saturday work is part of the all things. The necessity of handwork. Fourthly, consider the beauty of handwork. When we look at the tabernacle, we see God's concern for beauty. It's not just a a functional structure. There are practicalities involved. It's, It's been designed so that certain activities can take place in an orderly manner. It's certainly been designed with functionality in mind. But but there's something much, much more than that here. There's a beautiful proportion. There's a beautiful symmetry. There there are beautiful materials used. Beautiful colors. Beautiful textures. Beautiful design of of the various parts of it. So, this is not just a a practical, uh, bare bones type of sermon, you might say. It's, it's a beautiful sermon. It, it, shows, it shows us how much God loves beauty. Phil Riken says this, We serve a beautiful God who made a beautiful world, which he saved through his beautiful Son, so that we could live forever in his beautiful presence. This is a God with a regard for beauty. Why? Why? All these chapters on the materials and the colors and the structure and the design. It's God saying, this is who I am. I am beautiful. I make beauty. I love beauty. I appreciate beauty. Jonathan Edwards says, all beauty is a reflection of God's brightness and glory. God is the foundation and fountain of all beauty. And that's what we see here. And therefore God is calling us. God's calling us to, to image him. To be like him. In appreciating beauty. But also cultivating. Also creating beauty. Wherever God has called us. And, and that's really the question that. That challenges us day by day. You know, Bezalel and Aholiab were given extensive instructions, but not exhaustive instructions. There was still considerable leeway for their own creativity, their own input. And and filled with the Spirit, there's no question that that they would have that, that their creative gifts and skills would have flourished in a unique way. And so, how can I, how can I reveal the beauty of God in my daily life? How how can I reveal, how can I show God's beauty on my farm? How can I show God's beauty in my home? How can I show God's beauty in my office, in my study? This is what God longs to see. He longs to see his beauty being manifested in all sorts of spheres. It was certainly manifested in the tabernacle and and not just in the physical structure and materials. It's interesting that actually if you were to look at the tabernacle from outside, there was no beauty at all because it was designed with very waterproof animal skins on the outside. They were purely functional it was only when you actually got inside you began to see the, the, the design and the beautiful furniture and, and the embroidery and things like that. that. That's interesting, isn't it? It's sort of helping us to, to see that there's something more important than outer superficial beauty, that there's an inner beauty. And, and when we think of the tabernacle, what's most beautiful is the message of the tabernacle. 
Yeah, yes. It's a beautiful structure. In fact, you know, if, you, if you're an Israelite, you're, you're looking at this. You're, you're, you, remember, you're in the desert. You're in the sand. You're in this baking heat. And God says, make me a tabernacle. Make me a tent. So you start, and then you, then you hear all these instructions, so intricate, so elaborate. A, a tent, I mean, tents are skin and, and wood. You want gold, you want silver, you want purple, you want scarlet, you want fine linen, you want intricate, th- even the very um, pins that went in the ground to hold the poles were specified, silver and size and well, if you're an unbelieving Israelite, you're going to find this unbelievable. Because you just think, that what is the point in this? In the middle of the desert? It's so out of place. Unless you're a believing Israelite, because then you see there's something much more than a beautiful tent here. There's a beautiful message that's been communicated. Remember the psalmist in Psalm 27, he says, One thing I of the Lord desired... And will seek to obtain that all days of my life I may within God's house remain. That I, the beauty of the Lord, behold, may and admire. And that I in his holy place may reverently inquire. Scottish Psalter, Psalm 27. Beautiful language. One thing he says I want. I want to get in that house and see the beauty of the Lord. Oh, it's beautiful. Well, there's something far more beautiful here than gold and silver and scarlet and purple. There's salvation here. That was the beauty of the Lord above all other beauties. He used physical beauty to attract people, to make them consider what he made. But he wanted them to see beyond that physical beauty. What was the tabernacle? What was the whole message of the tabernacle? It was this. God lives with sinners. You believe that? These are people that came out of Egypt. All they'd known was this distant Pharaoh in his palace. Never deigning to come down. And here they are in the wilderness. And God says, I want to be in you. I want to be among you. I want to live right on your level. I want to live like you in a tent. God lives with sinners. How can this be? Well, look at the altar. There we're told God forgives sinners. And he does it through sacrificial blood. Oh, that's beautiful too. That's what I need. And then you look at the, the laver, that huge big bath of water. What does that tell It says God cleans sinners. That's, that's, that's even better. That means I don't just get my, my guilt forgiven. I get my sin purged out of my heart. And then I go into the holy place and I see a table with showbread. And it's the bread of fellowship. And it's saying God fellowships with sinners. That's what eating was all about in that culture. You ate with those you were friends with. And then there's the lamp. God gives light to sinners. And then there's the altar of incense in front of the most holy place with its fragrance going up to heaven. What's that saying? We're told throughout the Old Testament. Incense is about prayer. God hears sinners. And then we go into the most holy place and we see a throne, a golden throne with cherubim on either side. And we see a mercy seat. And we see blood sprinkled on it. And we see a smoky glory. A glory cloud. The Shekinah, the dwelling of God there. What's it saying? It's saying God reigns over sinners. And will be served by sinners. No wonder the psalmist said, One thing I of the Lord desired. To see the beauty of the Lord. To admire his beauty in his house. And then you think of, that's just beauty in the shadows. It's just beauty in the shadows. It's the Old Testament. It's pictures. It's shadows. John tells us, the word became flesh and what did he do? 
AV says dwelt. Original language says tabernacled among us. Beauty steps out the shadows. The pictures become a person. No wonder John said, and we beheld his glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Far fuller than any tabernacle. Far fuller than any temple. Here we have all these beautiful messages enfleshed in Christ. And you know what's even more amazing? God's making you a tabernacle, believer. You're a temple of God. A dwelling place of God. God's making the beautiful God is doing a beautiful work in your heart. He is beautifying your life. Turning you into his beautiful image. The beauty of God's handwork. What's the aim of manual work? It's the aim of all work. It's the aim of all existence. And that's the glory of God. And how this work glorified God. You think of Bezalel's previous work. His previous training in Egypt, he's, he's building houses for Pharaoh's glory. But now he's building a house for God's glory. How much more satisfying this must have been for him. As he's cutting and nailing and sawing and painting and, and whatever else he's doing, he's, he's saying it's for the glory of God, for the glory of God. And especially as filled with the Spirit, how, how much, how much he must have appreciated that. I'm advancing the fame of God's name. And this too is the question that, that challenges us in our own daily callings. How can I glorify God? How can I advance the fame of his name? Well, obviously we do so by integrity, by diligence, by honesty, by fairness, by justice, by truth-telling. But maybe above all, we, we glorify God by aiming at excellence in all that we do. That's one of the fruits of the Spirit, that whatever we do, we do it with all our might, that, that we aim to do it to the highest possible standards. We aim at excellence. That's the aim of handwork, the glory of God through excellence. But consider, sixthly, the difficulty of handwork. Now, none of you would, would None of you would think anyone would come into this pulpit without praying for the Holy Spirit, would you? I mean, you wouldn't want anyone to stand here unless they've prayed for the help of the Spirit. We realize how, how difficult this work is. We, we are needy. We, we can't do this on our own. We, we need the text from God. We need the message from God. We need the manner from God. Without him, truly, we can do nothing. And yet, how many of us go about our daily work, Monday to Saturday, without such a prayer? Lord, bless me. Lord, give me of your spirit. And yet, that's what we find here. The Lord blesses Bezalel with a filling of the Holy Spirit. You need the Holy Spirit to build something? Well, clearly, yes, you do. 
And now Bezalel obviously had some natural abilities and he'd had some training in these abilities that had developed them. What did the Holy Spirit do for him? Well, probably took his natural abilities and, and heightened them. Probably gave him some abilities that he didn't have before. And certainly combined all of these together with an understanding of what he was doing. No one could be filled with the Spirit, surely, and not understand what they were doing, working on this image of God, this story of God's salvation. Now that, that, must, have, that must have been a huge motivation as, as Bezalel got up to work every day. It filled with the Spirit, given these abilities, heightened abilities, new abilities, but above all, an understanding of what he was doing. (coughs) This work must have been sanctifying work for him. It must have advanced his spiritual knowledge, his spiritual understanding. He not only had an impact on the tabernacle. The tabernacle had an impact on him. He didn't just create something that showed salvation. Surely that also had a a sanctifying and saving effect on him as well. And that's also how we should view our work. We're not just to have an impact on this world through our work, but God's given us our work as part of our sanctification. And he's made our work difficult. Maybe especially manual work, difficult. He's packed a lot of thorns and thistles into manual work. A lot of blood and sweat and tears so that we do not do this in our own strength. The difficulty of work is to draw us to the Lord so that we not only have an impact on what we're making and doing in our homes and factories and building sites or whatever, but that that's also having an impact on us, that it's driving us to the Lord, that it's making us seek his help. Whether we're gardening or parenting or building or painting or writing or speaking or whatever, we need the blessing of God. We need the Holy Spirit, whatever the work we've been called to do. Because all work is difficult work. And then lastly, notice here the heritage of manual labor. It's interesting in verse 34 we read, He hath put it in his heart that he may teach both he and Aholiab, the son of Ahissamach of the tribe of of Dan. Now we, we live in a day when a lot of the manual trades are being greatly devalued. It's like, you know, if you don't go to college, you're nothing. And, and so, so many skills and, and talents and abilities are being lost to our society. Which is without question going to cause great difficulties and economic problems in the years to come. Because of this unbalanced valuation of headwork over handwork. In fact, it's interesting. We're talking about handwork, but handwork requires headwork too. If you notice here, he filled them with the Spirit of God in wisdom, in understanding, and in knowledge, and in all manner of workmanship. Yes, he gave them ability and strength and agility and coordination, but he also gave them the ability to put all these things together. This, this God is really lifting this up as a, as a great calling and emphasizing that by saying, now you make sure you teach your children how to do this too. This was part of the Spirit's filling, a concern to communicate the value of these gifts and to cultivate these gifts and to continue these gifts. And again, God had a purpose. In 40 years, they're going to be in a new land. They're going to need to reconstruct a whole society after the the conquest of Canaan. He also had a plan, of course, to, to build a temple. They needed these skills continued through the years. 
And so there was this great concern to pass on this heritage. And that was something the Reformation also recovered. Prior to the Reformation, spiritual work was held way up there. And all other work was somewhere down there, if anywhere at all. One of the great achievements of the Reformers was to to emphasize the priesthood of all believers, the, the, the vocation of all believers. And to equalize these callings. Whatever calling you are in is your highest calling. And to leave whatever calling God has given you is to go to a lower calling. So the minister is not in a higher calling. Let me read you this quote. Martin Luther insisted that all forms of work are God-honoring callings. To be a farmer, a craftsman, or an artist was just as much a vocation, a calling from God, as to be a preacher. So, whether we're farming, whether we're building, whether we're painting, whether we're parenting, whether we're homemaking, whether we're preaching... The concern is this, am I in the calling that God has given me? And if so, I'm in the highest calling I could have. And to communicate that to our children and our children's children, to cultivate that and to to exalt what God has also exalted. That's a heritage worth passing on. And so the calling is create like your creator. Move out into this world as Adam and Eve were commanded to do. They were told to fill it, they were told to order it, and they were told to control it. That was before the fall. After the fall, it was renewed when God spoke to Noah. He gave gave him the same mandate again. Go out into the world. Rule it, fill it, Order it. And if ever that was needed, it was needed then and it's needed now because we live in a sin-sick world. An ugly world that needs beautifying. An empty world that needs filling. A disordered world that needs ordering. And that's what God calls his people to do. To go out and create in his creation. To show forth his creativity in whatever calling He has given us. And so we come to the Lord and we say, Lord, show me how to be creative. Show me how to beautify my little corner of the world. I visited an old couple through the week. And they've recently moved into a a retirement home, which has got so many rules. I mean, it's a beautiful place with so many rules. There's just so little scope for any creativity. And yet the, the older lady told me that She'd managed to get permission for this little square, probably not much bigger than that, just outside her patio door. And she'd beautified it. She'd filled it with flowers and shrubs and bushes. This was was her in her 80s now. Still being creative, still showing forth the beauty of God in her daily life. How can you do that? That should be your prayer. And we can all do it to one degree or another. And whatever calling we've got. But as we think of new creation, let's remember to begin with ourselves. We can, we can beautify all that out there and yet be totally ugly in here. When we look within by nature, what do we find? We find disorder. We find ugliness. We find chaos. We find emptiness. And we cannot make it right. This is one area of the universe we cannot make new. We cannot recreate. 
You can pull out as many weeds as you like. You can plant as many flowers as you like. You can paint it as beautifully as you like. And tomorrow it will be like a junkyard all over again. That's the human heart. And so we're called. Create in me a clean heart, O Lord. And renew in me a right spirit. And that's not just the the cry of an unbeliever seeking the work of God to begin in their hearts. It's the cry of the believer, isn't it? Day after day. Create in me a clean heart. Create in me a beautiful heart. Renew in me a right spirit. We need God's creative work within continually. Or else we Just tend to chaos and disorder and confusion and darkness. But the the joyful hope is God is willing to do that work. To make you a new creature. To create again in you. to, To make you in his image again. And The even greater news is that there's a new creation coming, a new heavens and a new earth wherein dwell new creatures. Nothing ugly, nothing dark, nothing chaotic and disorderly and lawless ever again. All injustice, all immorality, all lies, all war, all fighting, all driven out. A beautiful world, a beautiful universe for a beautiful people serving a beautiful God in a beautiful way forever. That's the Christian hope. Is it your hope, friend? If God has not begun in you and you remain like that, what's ahead? But darkness, forever. Chaos, forever. Ugliness, forever for you and and your environment in in an old world with old creatures, forever. A world that's cast into outer darkness, a world that's burning with fire and brimstone, a world full of Not beautiful songs, but screams and screeches of of tormented creatures forever. That's your choice. These are the options. There's nothing in between. You're heading towards dark ugliness or beautiful creativity. You're heading towards uncreation and decreation. Or you're heading towards new creation. As a new creature. Pray that God will attract you. That you'll see the beauty of the Lord. And say I want that. I long for that. Please give me that. And to begin today. Amen. Let's pray. O oh Lord our God, we confess that we get all our values so upside down and inside out, back to front. The way we value physical things, the way we value spiritual things. O oh Lord, give us a new value system. Give us eyes and hearts that see and love and cultivate beauty, that flee from all kinds of ugliness. O Lord, create anew today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.